So with those, with those um, logistics, it is my great honor to present our speaker, uh, Dr. Erica Fisher, who is an assistant professor of civil and construction engineering at Oregon State University. Dr. Fisher's research focuses on innovative approaches to improve the resilience and robustness of structural systems affected by natural and man-made hazards. She uses large scale and experimental testing and numerical modeling approaches. Dr. Fisher is a member of a number of committees, including the ASCE slash SEE Fire Protection Committee, Committee, I'm sorry, and ASCE SEI Sustainability Committee. And with that, uh, Dr. Fisher, the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much, Jeanette, um, and thank you all for coming. I'm very excited to be here and be a part of this, this webinar series um, as a longtime listener. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, I'm going to talk about wildfire impacts to water infrastructure. Um, and so this is um, a little bit of a, of a different topic. Um, we're gonna kind of speak about you know, what, what the impacts are to the physical infrastructure and the implications of that within the community. Um, and the, the phenomenons that and behavior that I'm, that I'm describing today um, have been prevalent throughout Western United States with Oregon still recovering their water infrastructure systems from the 2020 Labor Day fires. Okay, so um, as we all know um, on this call, fires are a natural occurrence within our landscape. So if they are a natural occurrence within our landscape, what actually is going to deem them a disaster? So at what point do we actually say this is, this is actually a disaster? Um, and what we have traditionally said in some of our other hazard research topics um, is that we are seeing um, a hazard become a disaster when we lose functionality within our community. And specifically, um, what I mean by that is that we, when we lose functionality within our community, certain entities need to be non-functional. Um, and that, that typically means our healthcare industry, hospitals, um, our educational institutions, uh, our, our, our schools, um, the water and electricity, so utilities, but in wildfire, we still have this housing issue. Um, and so this is one of really the only hazards where we're trying to protect the asset that also intensifies the hazard. So we're trying to prevent our homes from igniting because um, that's going to make the hazard more intense. But also um, what I'm gonna show you today is there's just some ripple effects through the community and onto these other critical infrastructure Structures, particularly water, when our housing does ignite. Okay, so, um, so again, I, I'm not going to focus too much on, on home hardening and defensible space as, as um, that's, that's for a different lecture, but um, this is an aerial, aerial view of a um, community in Louisville, Colorado that we collected during our reconnaissance um, of the Marshall Fire. And, you know, when we see one home burn, we, we see that um, that puts the, the others at risk to also catch fire. Um, and particularly if our homes are close spacely together, as you can see in this, in this aerial photograph. Um, so, um, you know, when we see these densely populated areas where our homes can burn and the fire can spread house to house quite easily, um, this not only you know, intensifies the hazard, but it's going to cause issues in our community um, with regards to our water infrastructure. And so I realized that I'm a civil engineer, um, but not everyone on this call is in the, on this webinar is a civil engineer. So let's give you a little bit of our water infrastructure 101. So um, when you, we are talking about the water infrastructure that's impacted by wildfires, we are, are talking about the pipes that connect the house to the water meter. So um, the these are called our surface lateral pipes. So they are typically buried 
um, about a third of a meter deep, but at some point they do need to connect to the house um, because our house is not buried a third of a meter deep. So um, they do pop up um, be below that burial depth in order to connect to the house. And it is that portion of our service lateral pipe that is most vulnerable to damage in, um, in a wildfire. And I'll explain to that in, in a second. So these pipes are normally about two inch diameter or smaller. Um, and when your water, from your water meter to the main transmission lines or the main water lines, that is also called a surface lateral, but those are, those are buried much deeper because our surface, our, our main water lines are also buried about over a meter deep. So those are those huge pipes that you see on the side of the highway as you're driving down the highway um, that might be you know, being put underneath our roads. And as we know, there really isn't a lot of fuel on top of our roads to burn. Um, so we really wouldn't see um, a lot of issues with our main transmission lines. All right, so what is the problem? All right, so now that you understand service lines and service laterals and the importance of our water infrastructure, um, what happens is that during a fire, as our homes burn, they are heating up the service laterals that are directly below the house or directly below the surface of the house. Um, and two things can happen. The first is that the pipe itself, the pipe material itself, can begin to leach volatile organic compounds um, into the water distribution system, and then it is transferred throughout the water distribution system as, as the firefighters are using the, the distribution system. <clears throat> and these VOCs that are being transferred throughout are quite hazardous. And we see the most popular one in the news is benzene, but we're actually seeing other VOCs uh, pop up and, and come out in, in the testing results um, that are also quite hazardous. And the reason this is this is quite uh, this is actually a big problem is because these VOCs, um, what ends up happening is you cannot boil the water and get rid of these VOCs, actually, then you just release it into the air. Um, and it's so you can basically not drink the water at all and not boil the water. The other thing that can potentially happen is that during a wildfire, we are almost maxing out our water distribution system, if not going over capacity and causing depressurization in our water distribution system. So when the entire house burns down, um, the, the water is still on at the house. So the water is um, is is trickling out of the house. Um, so you're leaking you're leaking water out of the system, um, and when depressurization happens, then all of the ash and soot in the air is sucked into the water distribution system. We've known for quite some time that some of these very harmful VOCs we're seeing in in waters after in water distribution systems after. A fire that those are also in the ash and soot um, from from the house itself. We have some we have a lot of things in our house that are not meant to be burned, um, and that causes contamination. So so the depressurization and the leaching of the pipes itself can um, cause uh, um, these VOCs to be present in in our water distribution system. Now there is a potential for contamination of the source water itself. That is a um, an ongoing that's ongoing research um, that many many different um, researchers at, at Oregon State University and other universities perform. But today we're going to talk about only the contamination that's within the the water distribution system due to these phenomena. All right, so what ends up happening um, is that we end up seeing melted portions of the water distribution system. Um, these top two figures and top two photos are of melted water meters um, in Paradise, California. And on the right are a lot of plastic water bottles. Um, this photo was taken um, outside of a restaurant in Paradise, California when we were doing work there. Um, and we found it alarming how many water, plastic water bottles were there and the extent that the restaurant was going to in order to reopen. Um, so, you know, we think about, you know, access to clean water, um, we, we take advantage of this. Um, and if businesses can't have access to clean water and residents can't have access to clean water, this really um, hurts the recovery of, of our towns um, with the reopening of schools, the reopening of medical facilities, the reopening of restaurants, all which use 
water um, significantly and, and need access to clean water. But it has taken some of these towns quite some time to recover from this. Um, in Santa Rosa and Paradise, it took them almost a year to figure out what was happening and come up with a path forward, um, sending millions of dollars in order to fix this issue. I mentioned Oregon. Um, we, we saw this in, in over 15 different communities in Oregon after the 2020 Labor Day fires. Um, and some of these communities are still testing their water today. Um, so almost two years after these fires. Okay, so what have we done? Um, so over the last three years, four years, we've been looking into this through multiple avenues. Um, and the first question that we had is we wanted to be able to know um, why is this happening and and is this related somehow to burn severity? So can we actually predict when, where and when this will happen based on burn severity within a community? In order to do that, we need to actually understand how to quantify burn severity within a community. Um, so I'm going to go over you know, the, the way we, that we, we've been doing that. And then we want to know, well, what is the critical temperature of these common service lateral materials. At what point, at what temperature do we begin to see a degradation of the pipe itself, meaning that we're seeing um, leaching of these contaminants into the water distribution system that exceed federal or state level maximum considered limits. So at what point, at what temperature of these pipes are these leaching contaminants such that the water in the pipe would be deemed contaminated? And then once we know that, we can actually try and calculate, well, is this, is this possible? Um, you know, what kind of surface conditions would we need in order to make this possible? Um, and start, start back calculating what, what would need to be the surface conditions um, of a house burning in order to create this kind of behavior. All right, so I'm gonna start here talking about burn severity and water contamination within, um, within the community. And so we, um, we started this project really focusing on Santa Rosa and Paradise. On the left, I'm showing Santa Rosa, I'm showing the bark map after the 2017 Tubbs fire. And on the right, I'm showing Paradise. The black outline is the town of Paradise. And this is the bark map after the 2018 um, campfire. And so we wondered, you know, this is what's typically used to um, quantify burn severity within the landscape, um, can we just use this within the communities? And what we found is we actually cannot. Um, so this, this red outline here is where the water advisory actually took place. This was the most heavily damaged area in Santa Rosa due to um, the 2017 Tubbs fire. And we actually see that the bark map shows that it has very low burn severity in there, even though high number of homes um, were, were actually destroyed. And same within Paradise, we all know that 90% of the homes were destroyed within the town of Paradise, but um, the bark maps are actually showing that this is low burn severity. Um, so when we start looking at, these are maps of, of damaged homes or destroyed homes. So um, the red dots are destroyed homes, the gray dots are no damage, and then we see okay, the uh, gradient in between. And so we, we actually see in the water advisory area in this, in this yellow outline that we do have a lot of red dots, a lot of destroyed structures. 97% of the structures were destroyed within that area. And then in the town of Paradise, 90% of these. So we started asking ourselves, well, you know, it, it, the bark maps are not actually giving us um, the burn severity that we're looking for. So how could we maybe calculate this in a different way? And so we started asking ourselves if there was a correlation between the locations of these burn structures and water contamination. Um, the, the results on the right is that this, these are all three plots of paradise, the bark map, the damaged and or destroyed structures, and then um, the water sample locations with the green dots being not contaminated and the red dots being contaminated. Okay, so um, we, um, we were, uh, I, we were trying to correlate the two together. So I'm showing this in a different way um, on this slide. On the top are the um, destroyed structures. Um, the black dots are destroyed. The white dots are no damage. And then on the bottom, we're seeing the, where the water sample locations took place with the black dots being um, 
they had contaminants that exceeded California maximum considered limits and the gray dots, um, meaning that the, the, tested, the tests came out with contaminants below the, the California maximum considered limits. So, um, you know, is there a correlation between these two maps? And we actually found that there was. Um, so we we first we started looking at what are the average number of damaged structures per acre um, around every single water sample, um, and we found that that in Santa Rosa we saw that there were more damaged or destroyed structures per acre around a um, a sample that ex that had VOCs exceeding the California maximum considered limit, and the same was true in Paradise. Um, so um, we're seeing that the density of damaged homes is actually an, an indicator, um, or potentially an indicator of of um, there that there's contamination. Um, we did the same thing for the. Um, for, for backflow or depressurization locally. Um, we only had that data from Paradise. We did not have that data from Santa Rosa. Um, and we were able to find the same thing that um, where there were more destroyed structures, higher density of destroyed structures, we saw um, uh, uh, higher densities of destroyed structures around the areas that there was backflow. And which, which, which makes sense, but it's nice um, when the math actually uh, follows the logic. Um, so um, with that, we are, with all of this data, we were actually able to develop fragility curves on um, what is the probability that the water sample would have VOCs that exceeded the California MCL um, or the occurrence of black backflow um, versus damage structures per acre. And so we can see um, when we have um, about four damage structures per acre, we have a little less than 10% probability of that the sample will be be deemed contaminated. Um, when we have about nine damaged structures per acre, um, we have about 50% probability that the sample will be deemed contaminated. And then when we go all the way up to 13 damaged structures, we're at about 78% probability that the sample will be deemed contaminated. Okay, so we, we can definitely relate this behavior of these water sample contaminations to the density of damaged homes. So kind of going back to the beginning, right? Like, why are we hardening our homes? Why are we using defensible space? Why are we mitigating in this way? Um, um, you know, obviously for, for property loss, for to protect our assets, um, to, you know, not intensify the, the hazard itself, um, but also to prevent this type of behavior, to prevent these water contamination um, issues that these communities are, are facing. Okay, so kind of thinking back to this, right? So our home um, is, is heating up our service line material. So we definitely know that that the, the home burning is, is contributing to this behavior um, that we're seeing of, the, of contaminated water samples. But now we need to actually ask ourselves, well, what are the critical temperatures of these service line materials? Um, and and um, at what point do we start seeing um, leaching of contaminants? Um, such that the water sample would exceed um, the, the federal or California maximum consider the maximum. All right, so what we did is we took small samples of pipe. Um, we looked at HDPE, PVC, galvanized steel, and copper pipes, so both plastic and metal pipes. These are commonly used pipes um, in service laterals throughout the United States. We heated these up in a, in a muffle furnace for about 30 minutes at temperatures ranging from 200 to 300 degrees Celsius. At the end of heating, we then took these pipes and we cut them up in three different ways and soaked them in water for one week. And then we tested the water per EPA 524.2, which is the same um, testing method that is being used in these communities um, after a wildfire. So we, we cut the pipes in three different ways to, to increase the surface area of the pipe itself um, it, that is being uh, exposed to water. So we could look at um, you know, what length of pipe 
do we actually need in order to um, you know, heat up a certain length of pipe to, to get these um, concentration limits of, of um, contaminants. So it's a, a very long piece of pipe that is very unrealistic and would never happen, um, or are we looking at shorter lengths of pipes um, in order to get contaminants that would um, you know, exceed the, the federal uh, maximum considered limits? We also looked at uh, cutting the pipes in three different ways um, to mirror what is being, how this is being tested at, in other facilities. There are other researchers around the country um, performing these experiments, and we wanted to look at what's the influence of cutting up that pipe in a different way to, to soak in water? What's the influence of looking at that pipe in different surface areas? Um, in each case, we actually kept the mass ratio between the water and the pipe consistent um, uh, and it, between every single case that we, that we looked at. And so starting with mass loss. So mass loss can be used as a, um, as a metric to, to kind of indicate thermal degradation. So on the, on the left, I'm showing mass loss of PVC. On the right, I'm showing mass loss of the high density polyethylene. And first thing to take away from these plots are that actually the mass loss in the PVC is an order of magnitude larger than the mass loss we're seeing in high density polyethylene, indicating that PVC is thermally degrading a lot faster than HDPE pipes. Right, so um, that was kind of the first first takeaway. Second takeaway is um, that that PVC has its first stage of substantial mass loss at approximately 300 degrees Celsius. So we can put trend lines through these um, these data points here, and and that's how we determined that. Um, and then HCPE, we had to extrapolate out um, using trend lines to see about 478 degrees Celsius is when HEPE is having its first stage of substantial mass loss. And that is consistent with what the other researchers mm -hmm. who perform experiments on these types of materials are finding as well. Right, so um, if we wanted to look at what actual concentrations of these contaminants we're actually finding, you don't have to focus on the magnitudes. Really, we're just focusing on the trends and we're focusing on the location of this red line. So, so looking on the left, this is the benzene concentration um, and this is our PVC pipes. So we're seeing that regardless of how we are post heat treating these pipes. Um, however, we're cutting them up. Um, we are seeing that the, con that the um, concentration of benzene far exceeds the federal maximum considered limits. We're also seeing that it peaks at 200 degrees Celsius and then, and then it goes um, back down at, at 300 degrees Celsius. We saw that PVC really um, melted and became quite aerated um, at, at these higher temperatures. Um, so um, it was almost just completely evaporating um, at, at, at higher temperatures. Um, if we look at, at the right, we're seeing again, um, almost an order of magnitude different be difference between these um, scales on the y-axis between the PVC and HDPE. And thinking back to what our math loss was, right? We saw the same, the same issues and the same um, behavior um, there. And so here with HDPE, we're really not seeing um, exceedance of the um, federal, um, maximum considered limits until that 250 degrees Celsius mark. And really it's only for, for one of the samples that we that we looked at, one of the types of post-heating treatments. Um, but however, both of these, regardless of how we're cutting up the pipe and, and soaking it in water, and regardless of how much surface area is exposed to that water, we are seeing that at 250 degrees Celsius, we are um, exceeding the federal maximum considered limits um, in, in the PVC and for our kind of small, small um, spirals, and I'll show you what that looks like in a minute, um, for our HDPE. Um, and from these from these plots, we can actually put trend lines through the through the data and and calculate when where the critical temperature is. So where do we see that um, these uh, these materials are leaching contaminants? This is just benzene. We actually looked at at 
and multiple different compounds. Um, and so where are we actually seeing that critical temperature where um, the, co the concentration of the VOCs leaching into the water exceeds the maximum considered limits. And we see that that temperature is lower for PVC than HTPE, which makes sense based on the data that we are collecting and we've seen throughout um, the testing. Okay, so um, if we focus in on this post-heating treatment, so um, we actually, we, we did it in three ways. Um, we used spirals where we just um, kind of drilled the, the material itself to create these spirals with high surface area. We used um, just cutting the, the pipe into pieces and then we looked at the entire section itself um, soaked in water. Okay, and what we found is, um, what I'm showing you here is the percent difference in, in benzene concentration from the spirals itself. We saw the highest um, concentration, um, almost always, uh, I'll show you some, some, some spots when we did not, um, almost always using the spirals. And that would, again, make sense we have the highest surface area. Um, so we, um, we, we, we can normalize the, um, we can normalize the concentration by surface area. And what we see is that at each temperature, we actually see great variation in the um, amount of, of, of normalized uh, concentration of benzene um, in, in the water itself, right? So, um, you know, like what, what this shows us is that we desperately need some sort of standardized testing method for these pipes so that we can compare experiments to one another. Um, it also shows that, that, you know, we do need to normalize according to our surface area um, exposed to water. Um, however, um, you know, these, um, at all the locations you see numbers in the boxes, those, um, those experiments did have concentrations of benzene that exceeded California and federal maximum considered limits. So regardless of how we actually um, cut this up, uh, we are actually seeing that um, the concentrations do exceed that, that, that limit. Um, and, um, you know, so that it's the, the, the method of, of soaking in water and um, and what is soaking in water is not as important as um, that we are in dire need of some standardized testing methods so we can compare one test to another. All right, so um, we were able to, just to summarize where we are so far. So we saw that our water contamination was correlated to our burn severity in the community. We can actually look at, um, we can see higher, um, you know, higher rates of, of higher probability of water contamination in um, areas that have high density of damaged homes. So if we have more homes damaged per acre, um, we are able to quantify these critical temperatures of commonly used service lateral materials. And so now what do we do with it? Um, so now we know that the burning homes are actually causing the contamination. We know that um, these pipes are, are also causing contamination. So now how do we link these two together? How do we look at what fire demands on the surface can cause pipes to exceed their critical temperatures? Um, and so to do that, we looked at um, varying the heat flux, temperature, and heating duration on the surface and performed a one-dimensional heat transfer analysis through soil, assuming that all of the heat transfer occurs through conduction. Um, we looked at different soil types, and then we looked at different burial depths of the pipe itself. Um, and our goal was really to see how does burial depth influence um, the, the ability of these pipes to reach that critical temperature um, and how does um, the, the presence of different surface heat fluxes um, influence that as well and heating duration. So we start with PVC pipe. So we looked at heat fluxes that varied from 15 kilowatts per meter squared, which is representative of about a grass fire to 30 kilowatts per meter squared. Our windows, if we are putting in um, you know, fire safe windows within our homes, they're usually rated anywhere from 40 to 45 kilowatts per meter squared. So um, we're not even looking at, at, at um, you know, potentially breaking those um, in a wildfire. Um, so we're not looking at heat fluxes that would, that would break that. The vertical red line is that, that critical temperature threshold at 194 degrees Celsius. And everything to the right of that 
of that red line is that means that temperatures have exceeded um, 194 degrees Celsius, right? So um, we can look at the two hour exposure, the three hour exposure and the four hour exposure. And we see that we are able to actually exceed the critical temperature threshold further down into the soil as we increase that exposure time, that heating duration. We are also able to see that um, we're, we're able to exceed that temperature threshold further down buried, when the pipe is buried further into the soil. Um, again, as we increase that surface heat flux. So as that fire intensifies, um, we're, we're seeing a higher temperatures further down in the soil. So kind of going back to that original premise of um, clusters of homes burning, homes very spaced very closely together. Um, when we see the surface heat flux at quite high, we are seeing that um, we're able to heat the surface laterals um, to quite high temperatures um, and, and far exceeding these contamination levels. And the same, we're seeing the same for our HDPE pipes. Um, we, the, again, the vertical line is that um, uh, 254 um, degrees Celsius line where that, that critical temperature threshold and all the temperatures to the right of that um, of that vertical line are temperatures exceeding that. Um, and again, we're seeing the same trends, higher surface heat flux, we're heating more of the soil further down and able to exceed that temperature threshold um, as well as our duration itself. Okay, so um, we're finding that, you know, at at least uh, four, four inches below the surface, regardless of any of these heat fluxes, we are exceeding these temperature thresholds for all heating durations. Okay, so um, again, right, our, our service lateral is connecting to our home. Um, it's buried at a certain minimal burial depth for, for most of, of the, um, of the service lateral. Um, however, it does need to come up and connect to the house itself. Okay, so kind of going back and summarizing, right? So um, the water contamination that we're seeing is related to burn severity, if we can quantify burn severity at density of damaged homes within the community. Um, and we're seeing that um, this is true for, for the presence of water contamination and also for the um, backflow uh, and the depressur local depressurization um, at, at properties. We're able to quantify the critical temperatures of common service lateral materials. Um, that, that's HDPE, PVC, galvanized steel, and copper. I didn't focus at all on galvanized steel and copper in this presentation because we found no contamination in any of our water samples. We tested these pipes um, at the highest temperature at 300 degrees Celsius, um, and we found absolutely no contamination um, in the water that was tested. And then if we look at the fire demands caused by these, what fire demands caused these pipes to exceed the critical temperature thresholds, we're able to see the diff that, that these, these temperature thresholds can be exceeded for varying heat fluxes on the surface from anything that could be attributed to a gap, the grass fire all the way to you know, a potential home fire, um, as well as um, looking at different burial depths through, through the soil itself. Okay, so um, just kind of summarizing again, but I did want to um, to focus on you know what are what are communities actually doing to recover from this behavior? Um, so the EPA developed a document um, about a year year ago um, or a year and a half ago that um, that focused on you know, providing communities with. A, a roadmap for what to do when this happens in their community or when they have um, significant damage um, as was after, after the Marshall Fire in, in Colorado. And what it says is um, to flush your system, um, a, a uniaxially flush your system. That means from, from, high, from high point to low point um, within your system elevation wise. Um, and then let the water sit within your system for about 72 hours. And after, um, after that, then begin to test 
um, your your water. Um, and so they have um, they they are finding that um, the water actually um, has this contamination when it has been sitting for about 72 hours within the pipes or within the, the damaged pipes. Some of these towns are replacing all the source laterals at every destroyed home um, or at every single home. Um, Paradise and Santa Rosa both um, replaced all the service laterals within the that boundary of where the water um, uh, notice was. Um, so for, for Santa Rosa, that was really in that Fountain Grove area in Paradise, it was throughout the whole town. Um, some, uh, we're seeing that some areas in Oregon are also following suit um, to replace all service laterals, but more commonly what we're seeing in Oregon is that um, they're replacing service laterals um, in just a portion of, of the um, destroyed service lateral. So they're looking at either 10 feet from away from the meter or um, or 10 feet um, away from the home itself if it was destroyed. So they're just looking at replacing a portion of the service laterals. Um, and they're doing so at only destroyed homes um, rather than all homes. Some um, communities such as Paradise, Santa Rosa, as well as some of the Southern Oregon communities are replacing service laterals in kind. So they're using the same materials. Um, and, and one thing to note is that all of these communities I'm indicating here are also in uh, seismic regions and some of them in high seismic regions. Um, that means they are at risk for earthquakes. Um, plastic pipes are fantastic and very ductile in earthquakes, um, allowing for a lot of movement um, of the ground itself um, without fracturing these pipes. So um, in addition, these, these pipes are really great for durability. Um, so you can put them in the ground and leave them there for quite some time. Um, and so there's a lot of benefits for, for these um, pipes themselves um, and, and why someone would, would use them and replace, replace the pipes in kind in the community. The issues arise in that um, uh, the the water district, it, their responsibility is up to the water meter, um, and then the homeowner's responsibility is from the water meter to the house. So a lot of water municipalities can keep track of the pipes um, in the main transmission lines, um, as well as the service laterals to the water meter, but they do not keep track of the pipes and the pipe material um, from the water meter to the house. So they don't particularly know um, what areas of their town is, is vulnerable to potential contamination when, when fires come through. Um, and so they're, they're not able to uh, respond in, in a more equitable way or respond in a systematic way um, to this potential um, you know, secondary hazard um, because they don't know where the pipes actually are. Um, so uh, a lot of um, that, that's a, that's a huge issue, um, but you know, uh, it depends on, on, the, on the area on where the water meter actually is. Um, in California and in Oregon, our water meters are at the curb. Um, in Colorado, the water meter is at the house itself. Um, so the, the town of Louisville definitely had all of the information on where and what material um, pipes were. Um, and the state of Colorado does not use um, plastic pipes um, in their service laterals. So um, there's different practices in each state. There's different practices um, in each municipality. Um, and that just makes this for a more challenging problem. Um, so, you know, one last thing I wanted to lead, leave on is um, is that we did we deployed a survey to um, about 23 water districts that were in Wui communities, and we were just curious to hear what decisions and what factors go into um, them deciding what materials to use, um, and and. Um, how aware they were of their risks. Um, and so 74% of the um, water districts said that they were at risk to wildfires. Um, however, less than 15% said that they actually consider wildfires when selecting service line materials or service lateral materials. So um, this isn't really an, an educational problem of, of hazard risk. I think it's, it's more of um, balancing you know, all of these different demands on the water municipalities. Um, 
usually corrosion and durability is their first priority. Um, if they're in high seismic regions, that might be, um, it's, it's kind of a trade-off um, between uh, earthquake mitigation and durability, um, which, out, you know, which, which will outweigh the, the wildfire you know, potential. Um, so it, uh, you know, I, I, the conclusion, you know, of, of our ongoing work is is really not that um, municipalities shouldn't use certain pipe materials, but rather they should keep track of where these pipe materials actually are. Um, so in the event that a wildfire does encroach on their community and um, is, you know, just spread through their community, they actually know where to go and replace these pipes and where um, the potential source would be. Um, so just to kind of summarize, you know, we, um, we're seeing the burning of these homes and we're seeing the burning of these homes impact our service laterals, um, as well as um, the co contamination that's found within our water distribution system. Um, and there's still a lot more to look at on or to study. Um, what we plan to be doing in um, the coming months, the coming years, um, is uh, we do have plans for large scale tests of our water networks, um, looking at more than just pipes. Um, we also have gaskets, valves, um, other types of materials that are not meant to be burned, not meant to be exceeded in temperature um, and may cause um, additional contamination that we're seeing in the water distribution system. We've also begun to look at what happens um, with uh, radiant heat transfer between homes. We have um, one home that ha is on fire, um, and and actually, you know, the, the other home does not catch fire. There will be some heat transfer between these two homes, um, such that we might have smoke damage in the unburned home. Um, in that case, the insurance company will strip the inside of the home down to the studs and replace everything inside. But um, what's not common practice is replacement of the pipes inside of the house. Um, so if you remember back to those critical temperatures that we found for, for just PVC and HDPE pipes, um, uh, those are actually below the temperature at which we would see timber charring. So we might see um, these pipes be exposed to temperatures um, above you know, their critical temperature threshold, um, but we might not see any physical damage within the house beyond just smoke damage. Um, and so something we're looking into is, you know, do should these insurance companies actually um, replace the pipes within the house? Um, is that a potential culprit um, for contamination um, in, these, in these communities that are more densely packed together, um, such as, as we saw in, in Colorado? Um, so I would like to thank um, many people um, who, who developed a lot of this work. Um, the current graduate student on the project, Amy Metz at Oregon State University, as well as two former graduate students at Oregon State University, Edward Richter and Stephanie Schulze. Um, my collaborator on a lot of this work is Brad Wham at University of Colorado Boulder. Um, and this research was funded by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, as well as the National Science Foundation. I want to thank you very much for your time and I'll take any questions. Thanks Erica for such a great talk. Um, very interesting to bring in the water quality and infrastructure effects um, perspective to our seminar. We have uh, quite a bit of questions. Uh, so I'll start reading them in the order that they were received. Um, the first one is from uh, Carol. Uh, she advises that she arrived, uh, or they advise that they arrived a little late, so maybe the question was already answered. So the question is, so why did the researchers use the BARC map compared to the RAVG map year of burn or BTS map for one full year uh, since the burn? So, and they mentioned that it seems like the BARC is about soil burn severity versus the other ones more often used for vegetation burn severity um, and that both of them would be useful for this study. Yeah, we were we were just trying to see if um, methods used um, to quantify burn severity in the landscape in the wildland could be directly translated onto a community to quantify burn severity within a community that has um, infrastructure and, and, and significant damage loss. Um, so uh, we, we chose the bark maps um, 
because that was the one we were we were familiar with um, at, at the time and and they were readily available for us um, for both of those particular wildfires. Um, ultimately, um, you know what we're what we're saying is that um, methods to, to to create maps on burn severity of vegetation um, don't necessarily reflect burn severity of of houses in communities. Um, and so we were trying to quantify um, burn severity within the community itself where the where the infrastructure was. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, we have a, a few questions from Eric um, that are related to the uh, heat transfer analysis. Um, they first thank you for the uh, presentation and uh, say that it's a very interesting work. Um, they mentioned uh, that they like to know about um, whether variations in soil moisture content were accounted for um, in the thermal conductivity. Um, also, they ask uh, what types of soils were considered. And then lastly, also related to the heat transfer, whether the effects of conduction through the pipe uh, uh, contained water were included in the uh, calculations. These are all great questions. Thank you for asking these. Um, so there is um, there is not a lot of data. Um, so if, if, if the person who asked the question, if you do have data on on um, thermal conductivity through soil, um, please 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 send it our way. We had a lot of trouble finding that type of data. Um, so we used um, actually thermal diffusivity values. Um, we did not look at varying moisture contents um, as if there is a wildfire, usually that moisture content is pretty low. Um, so we, we were not looking at, at burying that. Um, we uh, considered um, uh, silty, silt, um, silty like clay and silty loam um, soils. Um, we tried to um, consider soils that would be in Wui communities. Um, and I didn't, I didn't present heat, this here, but we did look at the effect of heat transfer through the soil, use it, varying that thermal diffusivity value. Um, and we found that it did impact um, the, uh, the temperatures of the pipes themselves um, on the surface of the pipes. Um, obviously not as much as the burial depth, um, but it did impact it. Um, and we are performing some experiments this fall on um, looking at, at testing a, a sensor that would indicate if a critical temperature threshold has been surpassed or not. Um, and we're, we're going to be testing that um, using different soil types and hopefully um, benchmarking our numerical models and, and um, publishing more data on heat transfer through soil. Um, and then the last question, um, yes, we did actually, so all the temperatures that I'm showing in those plots are the temperature on the interior of the pipe um, wall. So we looked at thermal conductivity through the, um, through the soil and through the pipe wall. Um, we did um, consider that the pipe was filled with water, um, but we did not consider that the water was moving. Um, so that would add a whole other dimension to, um, to the potential issue. Um, we did perform some experiments um, at OSU, uh, but we heated to very, we only heated to about 100 degrees Celsius on the outside of the pipe. Um, and we did see that the presence of water within the pipe um, greatly reduced the temperature on the inside of the pipe. Um, and so the, the difference in that heat transfer is, is quite large. Hopefully I answered all those questions. Yes, I was uh, looking at all of them. It looks like it was. Um, and uh, I think a lot of us will be looking forward to looking at the data that you get from your experiments that um, this fall it sounds very exciting. Um, uh, let's see. The next question here uh, asks, um, have you validated, it's again a question of um, thinking about heat transfer. Um, have you validated the temperature with uh, some experiments? And they mentioned the earth would act as a semi-infinite uh, solid with low conductivity. So um, their, their comment is that the temperatures uh, just seemed very high. And then they, they add that a wildfire moves away from one spot in much shorter time than, than two hours. 
And so they're asking, is there a reason why two hours or more were considered as those timeframes? Sure, yeah. So um, we have not been tracked our, our heat transfer model. That's, that's the hope of this fall um, to actually get experimental data we can benchmark it against. And you're right, wildfires do move quite quickly. Um, however, homes burn for quite some time. Um, so we are not thinking of that heat flux as a um, uh, as vegetation on the surface. We're thinking of it as a house on the surface. So the entire house has combusted and it is sitting for um, multiple hours burning um, uh, without any intervention. Um, so there's there there is data that it, it, it will sit for some, quite some time, um, much much longer than than the speed of, of wildfire moving through um, through a community or, or through vegetation. Um, so I think I think that was I think that, that addressed all of them. Hopefully, <laughs> please follow up if I haven't. Right. So we have a um, a question that I think you might have already answered, but I'll just ask it again just to make sure. Um, do you have plans to quantify the movement of the contamination through the groundwater system? And if the concentrations expected would be significant enough to damage the flora of the fauna and drinking water sources? Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. All right. So so we are looking at the um uh we are looking at the water that is already in the water distribution system. Mm -hmm. So it has surpassed the wastewater treatment plant already um, and is already in the system. Um, uh, there is research ongoing on contamination and potential contamination and issues with source water um, due to wildfires. And, and um, that is very much out of the realm of my expertise. Um, so I that's, that's not what we're looking at. Here. Um, in terms of looking at the systematic performance, um, that would be ideal. Um, I think I think we might be a, maybe a few years away from that. Um, but um, my collaborator Brad Wham is a pipeline expert, um, and our, our ultimate goal would be to be able to to simulate, you know, wildfire spread through a community, but also then look at potential for contamination and then how that moves through the the water distribution system. Great, okay, thank you. Um, we have a question here about the temperature ranges um, that were tested. Um, so uh, they asked, though they mentioned that the maximum temperature that was tested in the preps was uh, 300 degrees C, um, and that, but they argue that uh, homes, um, or their argument is that homes fire, uh, home fires typically burn out more than twice in that. Could you, uh, could there be further contamination or byproducts of actual combustion of the materials at higher temperatures, or do the results sufficiently explain what has been observed in the field? Yeah, yeah, home fires definitely exceed 300 degrees Celsius. We were trying to figure out, we were trying to quantify what that minimum temperature was. What's the minimum temperature of the pipe that we begin to see um, leaching of the contaminants? Um, and the goal, the ultimate goal of this, and I, I, didn't, I didn't have time to include this in the presentation, is um, to develop a sensor for the pipes that could tell you if that minimum threshold was exceeded or not. And the reason for that is because a lot of these communities are replacing all service laterals um, from the home to the water meter. Um, and that is really costly. Um, so if they could know that in certain areas that temperature had not been exceeded, then they maybe don't have to replace that pipe. Um, and that can save them money, that can save them time in the recovery. So we were focused on that minimum temperature threshold, but um, the, the person asking the question is, is definitely correct. We, we see extraordinarily high temperatures, far exceeding 300 degrees C um, in, in a wildfire, in a, in a, when a home is burning. Thank you. And it sounds like those sensors would be a great addition to our internet of things that um, are slowly being added to our homes um, to make them more resilient. Um, uh, there's a question here um, referring to um, ex uh, the exposure to in um, various intensity and duration of fire um, on buried pipes. 
they're asking, um, where is the range of the most realistic exposure for wildfire in the community? And do we have enough data on that? Great question. Um, and it's, uh, they follow up saying, is um, burning pipes at 0.1 meter or less uh, common or not? To answer your first question, um, uh, we uh, we do not have enough data on on um, heat fluxes that our homes are being exposed to in these communities. But um, I'm very hopeful. There's a lot of experiments being performed um, by IBHS. Um, there's a lot of, uh, in conjunction with NIST and CAL FIRE, there's also experiments being performed by Underwriters Laboratory right now. And um, we are, are hopeful that that data will be published soon um, so that we can use that um, and even look at time dependent um, heat flux variations to, to really simulate those surface conditions. Um, so um, it would, it, if, if anyone does have um, additional data that we aren't aware of, please, um, here's my email on the screen, um, please send it our way. We would love to consider more realistic um, data from experiments that are happening. Um, the, the second question, um, we are seeing melted pipes. Um, we are seeing pipes that are just completely um, decimated. Um, so, uh, and this is not uncommon at all um, in, in, our, in these communities. In addition, some of these more rural communities are using um, uh, irrigation lines. They're reusing irrigation lines as water lines, um, and those can be buried quite shallow to the surface, um, and not just the part that pops up and attaches to the home, but some the parts that are buried. Um, so our building codes only address new construction. So when we look at these minimal burial depths, that's for brand new construction. But um, a lot of these communities are, are older communities with older construction um, where the pipes might be buried a lot shallower. Thank you. And I agree that that data sounds incredibly valuable for, for the entire community. So looking forward to that one as, as, as well. Um, there's there's a question here um, that asks, um, do you see some type of heat shielding being cost effective for inclusion in water distribution systems in wildfire prone communities? Oh, um, I do not know. Um, um, I, yeah, I, I have no idea. I'm not quite familiar with, with heat shielding um, being used uh, within these communities and what the cost would be. Um, so uh, definitely something to look into and I'll, I'll probably end up like looking that up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I think this is the last question that we'll ask. Um, how might PVC irrigation systems participate in your backflow scenario? Uh, the typical irrigation system backflow valves protect against post-fire distribution system contamination. And how prevalent are PVC irrigation systems in suburban and wooey areas? Um, I'm not sure with the, the, the PVC, the irrigation systems, um, um, we're, I'm, I'm not quite sure how you would see backflow there. Um, we're measuring backflow through the water meter. Um, so that's how we know it's actually happening. Um, and, uh, and we're lo on the local like property level um, and we are seeing depressurization of the water system um, globally in many of these communities. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if, if in irrigation systems, it, it's possible for there to be backflow into the drinking water um, system. Um, but that's definitely, that's an interesting point and um, I will definitely look, look into that. Thank you. Well, um, that's all the time we got for today. Thank you, Erica, for answering um, all the questions. I think uh, that the number of questions reflected just how great the talk was. We, there was a few questions that we didn't get to, but um, such an interesting talk, so timely. So we really appreciate um, Erica's time for presenting on our seminar series and everyone else is, uh, in the audience's time for tuning in again. Please uh, tune, uh, tune in to our next um, seminar coming up uh, soon. Just uh, keep an eye out for that. And I uh, hope everyone has a, a great rest of your day. Thank you.